Welcome to the Endless Honeymoon Podcast. Today is a beautiful day. We're very excited. We're we're recording in the morning because we usually record in the evening, but sometimes we have people on the East Coast that we just have to talk to. By sometimes we mean this time only have we found a guest fussy enough to refuse an evening recording session. Well, to be fair, it was 11.30 p.m. when we were going to call him. It's also a good day because Natasha and I have taken both the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Oxford <laughs> vaccine. I don't know if you guys know this, but all the major Hollywood agencies have allowed people of a certain standing, blue check marks and up, to get the vaccine in the first round. We beat the uh, first responders. We beat the senior citizens. We beat the people who have compromised immune systems. I am feeling great. Very exciting news. Yes. We also vaccinated our dogs, even though we don't know for sure that dogs can catch COVID-19. We just thought it would be cute. Do you think there's like super rich people right now whose whole family is already vaccinated? I do wonder if there are if there are dark pipelines. And then they just still wear masks out in public so nobody knows. It does seem impossible that Jeff Bezos <laughs> doesn't get a vaccine in the first round. It seems hard to believe, doesn't it? Yeah. Would you take it right now if I had like a uh, if I had a guy like an, I had a guy in North Hollywood that said he could hook you up? But here's the thing. I'm not doing anything. I'm not going anywhere. So mm. I don't really need the vaccine right now. And if I had it, what am I going to do? Go hang out with nobody? I would go straight to the club. But the clubs aren't open. I would open the club. I would call it vaccines with a Z. I'm good. I, I think I'll wait till, you know, next September when my turn rolls around. Whenever the lines are down, that's when I'll go. You would look good with Bell's palsy, though. <laughs> with a little bit of a f frozen face. <laughs> We're kidding. We're going to take the vaccine as soon as it becomes available to us, obviously. I want to get back to the world, man. I want to go travel international again. I want to get on the road and do stand-up again. I wonder if international travel, if there's going to be a sweet spot, like maybe next summer, people won't have freaked out quite yet. Like, and not everyone will be right. ready to travel. You want some fear left, but it to be an unreasonable fear. So the, fe yeah. the unreasonable fear keeps some of the crowds away from the Mona Lisa in Paris. Exactly. And then we can go see Europe, how it was intended in the 1950s. Right after. Just like people walking around before or, like the masses started traveling. Or even in the 1550s, right? Right after the Black Death took out a third of Europe. I bet it was an amazing place to visit. A lot of room. I'm just saying the times that we've been in Paris and Venice, oh. the throngs of tourists that like, the it's like they get unleashed. The hardest thing we've ever been through was the times <laughs> that we were in Paris and Venice and there were throngs of I'm tourists. I'm just saying it wasn't very fun. I, I had a, well, Natasha, I had a great time in Paris and Venice with you. I had a lot of fun. I did too, but when we were out at like four in the morning, remember we would wake up at like 4.30 a.m. to go look at the sites. So before like all the people started coming out, like that was a, a jet lag haranguing you. Yeah. Running into you, well, yelling at you. The truth is Venice isn't even, Venice is a place, if you've never been to Venice, it's beautiful, but it feels like you're in a, a really enhanced uh, village at Disney World. Not at four in the morning. No, at, at four, four in the, in the morning, morning. It's a singular place that you've never been to before you can still see the uh, the ghosts of the masquerade balls it's so gorgeous and they have like you know their their cuisine is like italian but <laughs> seafood cause it's all by the sea is this not very relatable it's, i'm just saying uh, i miss traveling no it's relatable remember when we paid them in we were able to pay them in rubies we brought our ruby collection from home <laughs> and we didn't have any euros but it was well, okay we went on our honeymoon vacation thing to uh, to venice it happens we uh, saved I, up. We I stayed don't know in if an I'm Airbnb. Supposed, I don't know if I'm supposed to yes and you here or be honest and say we did not, We're not take our honeymoon. We're not a honeymoon. It was like an anniversary celebration. An, an endless honeymoon, if you It was you an will. endless honeymoon. Speaking of the endless honeymoon uh, and uh, effete, erudite, fancy type people, we have one of our favorite people and comedians and actors. He was peepers in another period on today. He really is one of the best comedic actors. I've been a huge fan even before I was li like actually considered a comedian. I was like an open micer, but I used to watch him on Stella. And then you became his employer. The so that must have been nice. The Comedy Central TV show and that which was also a live show that I never saw. If you never saw the Stella Shorts, man, they are legendary. But I've right seen now them since. Oh, and also his book. I just read it. It's amazing. It's called A Better Man and he 
it's it's like letters to his son and I'm actually learning a lot about parenting. Well, why don't we find something out about what it means to be a better man and a great comedian and a great guy. Ladies, gentlemen, everyone else, Michael Ian Black. Hi. Hi. Hi, Michael. Oh, wait, my video. Michael's like living the li- the life that everybody wants to be living right now. Is that right? He's like lives in the forest <laughs> in like a designer house. Yeah, that's right. But look at you. <laughs> yeah, we live in this shit land. What do you mean? We have a great situation. We have a great house, but we live in Los Angeles and, you know, it's we can't go like walking around the fort. Michael, you look so good. All right, that's enough. No, it's true. <laughs> Wait, is, is it growth hormones? Are you like, uh, you look like you're like reverse aging, but you're, you know. No, I think it's the ring light. I don't feel good. Oh, good. <laughs> my That's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, my face is all fat and puffy. And you look slim, straight. slender, straight up. Straight up, it's the ring light. It's the angle and the ring light. Like if I do this. See? Oh, I see it. You look terrible. <laughs> yes. You fat pig. I can't yeah. believe it. Yeah. <laughs> Mo- uh, Moshe was just roasting you for not wanting to do an 11:30 podcast, but I'm with you. I don't want to do them either at that late. Michael, tell us uh, how does one become a better man? Why do men need to become better? Yes, we've been raving about your book, which I loved, and I feel like I'm learning about parenting. It's so honest yet so funny. Um, I mean, uh, why do people? Uh, because men are, men generally do terrible things. We generally behave terribly. Um, we're immature. We're emotionally stunted. Nuh-uh. You guys you sound you, like a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you guys Everybody rape? that you know and hang out with. You guys rape? We, 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 what do you mean you guys rape? <laughs> We're talking about men. <laughs> no, it's true, though, that I used to have a bit that was something like that. Like, if you took all of the, like, the sexual assault, molesting, drive-by shooting, murder... <laughs> Ninety nine point nine percent of it is over in one bubble of humanity, and the other, the other bubble of humanity sometimes has to enter the ninety nine point nine percent bubble to find a mate, which is the most terrifying thing. Yeah, I mean, we do all of it. We do not all of it, almost. And the stuff that we don't do, like we're, the, we're like when a woman murders a man, it's generally because he's beating her up or. Throwing, throwing her downstairs or lighting her on fire. Men are awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, it, it, women don't even have to really be uh, like account for themselves, right? I like that. <laughs> Natasha, by the way, speaking of, uh, of sociopathic women, Natasha read a report in uh, the, the weather report this week said that there were dangerous rip currents in the surf in Los Angeles. And she kept saying, do you want to go surfing this week? <laughs> all week long. She was like, did you want to hit the, hit the waves at all? Did you want to? I don't know what that means. Maybe you do want to go to the East Coast, but without me. No, I mean, the quarantine's been rough. So, Michael, well, what? Look, I'm, <laughs> go ahead. Can I just give you some advice about rip currents? If you find yourself being dragged, dragged out, what you want to do is you want to swim parallel. To- Don't tell Moshe that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the truth is, Michael, about rip currents. I read an article recently that said the same amount of people, actually more people are saved by giving up in a rip current and, because, and that the rip current will, will bring them back to shore than people that go hmm. parallel. So the, the other advice they say is give up. Just let it float you back to shore. So there you go. You guys read a articles about currents <laughs> um w- michael your internet uh, well it's just like every every sentence there's like a word that kind of drags yeah so yeah, maybe yeah. we should just do a phone thing let me disconnect and come and see if okay okay we'll be right here hi hey okay let's see if this works well, let's just talk to him for a second and see it's nice to see you guys yeah it's good to see you too and is your quarantine okay are your kids home my kids are both home. My quarantine's been excellent in so much as like, I like being home and I like that I can't, I, I like that I'm not allowed to do stuff because it gives me an excuse for not being able to get a job. It's like, I can't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just not allowed. <laughs> oh, the, the offers would be rolling in were we in normal times, but as a result of what's happening, I don't have to, be, I totally relate to that, by the way. Yes. It's nice to have the universal meltdown of all society. <laughs> Make it so that you don't have to feel pressure to get work or to be relevant. 
Yeah, it's been great. That part has been great. You know, just it, it, because because my career has been slowly fading to black anyway, and this accelerates it in a really nice way and gives me, I think, just the perfect excuse. You know, it's like a business shuttering or something during the pandemic. Maybe the business probably wasn't going to make it anyway. But the pandemic's like, yeah, the pandemic fucked my restaurants. Are, you know, we had to close the doors. Well, Michael, you're an author. I have, I think you just pitched the title to your next memoir. Fade about, to Black. Fade to Black about the end of your career. <laughs> Wait, but can I just say Michael is probably the funniest comedic actor that I've ever witnessed and everything you do, not just our show. I mean, I don't know. You know, Ernest Burning P- Love, he was making me laugh out loud like all the time, losing takes. So I, the point is, Michael, you look younger than ever. I think it's time for a resurgence. I don't know. You, I, I, you're you good, Michael, but have you seen Ernest P. Worrell's work? <laughs> Ernest goes to camp. Very good. Or, you know, all the, I mean, yep. he, was a, he was a really a monster. <laughs> and a true original. And... Uh, <laughs> Do you know the story? But, you know, it was an it was a it was a two man act. People don't give Vern enough credit. That's right for his work. Well, by the way, his career. Do you know Do you know what his career story is? He started as a spokesperson for Mellow Yellow Soda, and then had like an eight picture deal at some point. So <laughs> never has there been an, a, a wilder career trajectory than you just get a commercial and then you're making movies like thirty years later. Well, flow from those progressive commercials is is uh, the movie franchise around her. I was going to try to think of a funny director, and my my mind ran out of the joke before I lost interest in the joke. <laughs> Wait, is she really? No. Oh, she's a groundling. No, she's talented. No. By the way, I saw uh, I saw a promoted tweet on Twitter the other uh, day from Progressive Insurance that said, "What are your financial?" Uh, savings plans in 2021 and the first comment was a guy saying the problem is not the police the problem is that black lives matter is a terrorist organization i just thought (laughs) why are you tweeting to the corporate account of progressive insurance (laughs) an unrelated grievance about the political process because al sharpton progressive auto i don't know if you know that oh i did not know i did he said he saved a lot of money now um, Michael, speaking of being progressive, do you do you have some top um, top tips on ways in which the modern American man can improve themselves? The weird thing is, like everybody knows how to behave. People right. know, generally speaking, how to. Be- what about like getting in touch with your emotions? You know, like men have testosterone and it's just pumping through them, so they're not able to like take a step back. Typically, in the same way that a woman can. No, I don't buy that. I don't buy that. I mean, it's men have testosterone, but I don't think it, it, it doesn't in our emotions. The, the, the way we're raised and the culture inhibits our emotions. I mean, we feel everything. We're just not allowed to kind of express it. But what I, I, I hear what you're saying. Everybody kind of knows the right way to act, but we're so inundated with these sort of sedimentary layers of conditioning and societal programming that men seem like propelled by their by their sort of you know male ego id thing how do how do you propose if you do propose guys get to the point where they can shed some of that because i will say michael you might not have like overflowing testosterone but for example moshe he gets in fights no, at, at white tablecloth restaurants if someone pisses him off he'll start <laughs> yelling across the restaurant at someone i would never do that ever in a million years whereas like he's not even no. thinking he's just re- reacting no michael knows that i'm sort of considered in the comedy community the most testosterone laden <laughs> man right i mean you know that about me well, well known for. Yeah. I mean, I would say it's you and then right behind, like just behind is Joe Rogan. Yeah. <laughs> but that's how I would rank Classically, it. Classically, that's a classic consideration. I was in the Vulture article, I believe. Top 10 most testosterone laden <laughs> comedians of 2020. I'm just saying, you guys, I, I might be wrong, but I do see, I witness with Moshe that his testosterone like steps in front of him sometimes. But, but you're, when you're talking about testosterone, you're talking about like one very specific slice of the male experience, which is when you get so angry that you start reacting like a madman. But Michael, I, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like what you're talking about is the general experience of just being a man in the world, which isn't driven by testosterone, is just driven by, by society and what it means to be a man. 
I think it's driven by a lot of things and and what it means to be a man is a, a, a difficult thing to define. But I think what that means is um, it's a it's a it's a kind of set of characteristics that we put onto men's shoulders and say, this is how you act when you're a man. And a lot of times like you exhibit those characteristics, um, but so do women. But what happens is when you, when, when you sort of assign a certain set of characteristics and you say, this is what being a man is, you're kind of saying, and nothing else you do or feel uh, is what being a man is. So that's why you can say to somebody, act like a man. Because what they're saying is, you know, tear away whatever other experiences and emotions you're going through right now and just inhabit the, the, the narrow set of characteristics that we, that we define for you as what being a man is. And so if you're not doing those things, you're therefore not being a man. And is there any place? Um, do you have any questions, Tosh? No, I'm just so glad I'm a woman. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess I wonder, uh, do you think there's any place for the idea of being a man or or masculinity would it be better if we eschewed the entire yeah. concept what is so what is the good version well there's a lot i mean i think there's a lot of good in men and i talk about this a lot in the book like those characteristics that i'm talking about um among them strength independence fortitude those are all great characteristics like there's no reason to to get rid of them or jettison them or say like men shouldn't exhibit those of course we should where we get into trouble is when we only exhibit those and uh and we funnel every other emotion into those but we you know women we celebrate for being strong women and independent women and uh greedy women and fierce women like those are all like traditionally male characteristics that we that we're now saying to women hey by the way you should do these things too and we celebrate that but we're but when men do it now we're calling that behavior toxic because a lot of times it is toxic because a lot of times we go too far with it because a lot of times we cut ourselves off from everything else that's going on in our lives and so when you're pissed off at a restaurant you may you may think it's testosterone doing that um i would say it probably isn't it's probably about a kind of wounded pride or some sense of your honor being disrespected or something that's going on with you and you don't have and when I say you, I mean me too. Like we're not given the tools to deal with that shit appropriately. So we lash out. I bet you're right. You know, what's interesting, Michael, is our two-year-old daughter keeps saying every time I say, you know, you're such a good girl. She's like, I'm a girl boy. Mm. And she just keeps saying that. And like, she doesn't uh, like when someone calls her a girl. I, I've been I've been screaming at her every time she says it. I say, you're a girl, you're a girl. And she, it's, she's not reacting well. But, now. Yes. but I've never heard you of her, her girl hey, boy. I not a man. You've got to nip that shit in the bud. <laughs> I just scream at her. I scream, "Act like a woman. Act like a woman." Just based on what you were saying, that's that's the good. That's the goal. But I love that she's invented this term. She didn't hear it anywhere, and she's just very like you know. She she really identifies what do you think with she it. Means by it. I don't. I don't know. She's just. I think she means like I'm not just a girl. I'm also <laughs> a boy. Well, here's what here's what I think she means by it. Natasha and I go back and forth on this. Um, Natasha is under the impression that everything our <laughs> lovely, intelligent, bright, special two-year-old daughter who babbles incoherently all day long, everything she says Natasha takes seriously like it's like reading the tea leaves or like a uh, dream interpretation. <laughs> so when she, she'll say something to Natasha, like the other day she said, what did she say to you? you She's oh. like, my grandma died and this is where she used to sit. Yeah. And yep. Natasha's like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's she can feel her grandma, and I'm like, but her grandma didn't die. Like, which grandma is she talking? She doesn't have a, a dead grandma. You don't get it. She's channeling past lives. <laughs> Kids at that age, up to about age four or five, they're just conduits for their own past lives. That's what I'm saying, Mosh. I think Take he's being sarcastic. Shit. Seriously, <laughs> there you go. It's sarcastic. You know, it's funny. I know Michael yeah, said that, but I really want to. I want to implant that idea in Natasha's head <laughs> so that she drives you crazy <laughs> nope. with her going. Wait, maybe Mikey, Michael was right. Maybe she really is channeling past lives. I definitely did that shit when my kids were little. I definitely was like, so wait a minute, what do you remember about your grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> But 
the boy girl thing, she's she she correct she corrected the nanny the other day. It means the nothing. nanny asked me about it. It means nothing. It definitely means something. It means nothing. She's just toying with the idea of gender, and when she gets older, she'll figure out that who she actually uh, is. Well, I hope she's a boy girl. Well, uh, that's I possible. Means- what I think it points to is that even at two years old, she understands the difference between girl behavior and boy behavior. Totally That's what true. I'm interesting about it. Um, you know, we don't think that those gender classifications come into play so early in life, but they absolutely do. No, I totally agree. And we've tried. I was very self-conscious about that because I hated the idea. I just think my, my ultimate iteration of the absurdity of gender programming is toddler baby suits for girls that have a top a bikini they have a bikini top <laughs> and i'm like what what are we what is it for what are we what are we covering in, in, it's, it's so it's so you can see her belly button ring <laughs> But really what it is, is it's going, it's actually telling a little girl, like, someday this will be a, a danger zone. No, so cover now. Today. Like, it's conditioning. Today I woke up with her at 7.30. You were still sleeping until 8.30. And she touched my boobs. When I woke up, she goes, oh, mom, when are my boo-boos going to get big? I want big ones. <laughs> I swear to God. What do you think that means, <laughs> Natasha? No, she goes, I want big ones like you. Well, I think it's funny that she thinks mine are big. Right. Well, you know what's interesting, Michael? You'll be fascinated by this. Our Her dead grandmother had the fattest titties. Like they were just <laughs> humongo. They were really great. <laughs> um, well, why don't we... We only have Michael for an hour, so let's take some calls, Moshe. Okay, great. Let's take some calls. Um, yeah. Chime hey, in. Yes. Moshe, just be, before we take a call, I just want to encourage you because I think you're probably being a really responsible dad in terms of like not doing the whole, you know, gender programming thing to the best of your ability. But one, a a step further that you can go is when you walk around naked, tuck your dick between your legs. (laughs) But this is what's interesting to me, Michael, is that you've written this book about masculinity and the new definition of a useful version of masculinity and your whole comedy career, well, specifically Stella was all about like that, that the toying with the edge of like, like, you know, manness and like silliness and being a fop, but also being very aggressive at the same time. Like, I, I'm sure there's some linkage there. Like, do you feel that way? Like your early comedy work led to this philosophical understanding now? Oh, yeah. Oh, um, no doubt. Because if, because I I wouldn't have put it in these words because I I wasn't really conscious of it. But I've been like, questioning gender and what what manhood means and what boyhood means my whole life like i i wasn't aware that i was doing it but i totally was i mean i I grew up in a lesbian household with my mom and her partner who you know for a time anyway basically hated men and there were three boys in the house and you know we used to hear shit about men all the time and what dicks they were and what assholes we were and you know that has an effect on you mm-hmm. growing up clearly you know when you're a boy <laughs> and you're hearing that your gender is just terrible and for a long time like i just i and i knew that i didn't like fit in exactly with the guys in like my new jersey town like i wasn't like them in a lot of ways um and so so much of my comedic outlook was informed by that. And when I look back on like, you know, my first comedy album or something like that, uh, where I've got like a whole thing about how people just assume I'm gay. Um, all of that is like tied to, to this stuff. Stella's tied to this stuff. And this book obviously is a result of all of that. Will your son read the book? Um, yeah, my son has read most of the book. That's so cool. Cause it's pretty much a letter to him. I mean, it's, it is literally it's written as a, it's it's called a, a better man, a mostly serious letter to my son, and in fact, it is a letter to my son, and it is mostly serious. It but would have been very funny if he refused to read it. <laughs> he did for a while. He had it on his table. He had it on his night table for months, months before he cracked it open. Did he have any? We will get to the call, but it was such a sincere book, and I was like, "Wow, you are such a good parent." Like your son must have it must have affected him, and and I mean, I learned from it so much. Like you, it, it's you're so thoughtful as a parent. I don't know that he learned anything. I mean, he hasn't finished it for one thing. I mean, he, you know, when I say he's read most of it, he's has said he's read some of it. So I'm exaggerating how much of it he's read, and he's <laughs> exaggerating to me how much of it. He's it read. sounds like both of you are trapped in the cage that is. 
today's masculinity with your Definitely. estimations of how much you've read. I mean, that is the funny thing about having a teenage son is like you write this heartfelt, like thoughtful work <laughs> for him. And in the end, he's still just like a teenager and it's just like, I'm good. I don't like books. <laughs> it's like, but you imagine like, <laughs> his son reading it and it being this yeah. sort of like no, thing in the family. It'll I mean, have it's... a great impact on him when you've been dead for 17 years and he's looking <laughs> back on it. That's the joke that I made. Oh, really? I, I, I keep telling him that. Like, this is going to be one of the first things you read when I die. <laughs> <laughs> and your daughter's going to be like, where's my book? I know. Well, you know, there's a lot in this book to her as well. But it's, you know, it's for the guy. It's for the guy in my household because, I, lo- you know, he's my son. I love him more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, well, yeah, let's get to a call. But I do want to say, <clears throat> Michael, I really relate to everything that you're saying. Like, I, I grew up in very similar circumstances, uh, household and man attitude wise. And like, but Moshe was raised by his mom and her mom. So they weren't. Well, I don't know they if your weren't grandma fuck, they weren't was, fucking, no. but I don't know if your grandma maybe was a lesbian, but it, it, it certainly could be. But the point is, like, it was definitely like a, it was a, we love you, but we don't love who you, you represent. And I, I, I really related to that. And I also just like this idea of masculinity becoming this sort of whatever the opposite of a, a velvet handcuffs is. It's like these steel, <laughs> I guess, just handcuffs. Like, handcuffs, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But this idea that you're trapped in this this thing that you didn't even sign up to be trapped in, but you're still giving, you know, shoveling coal into the furnace of it just to keep you going. Like to be able to dis disengage with that is like I think a goal for everybody. So anyway, yeah. I love it. Get the book. Let's take a call. Okay. You want to give some advice to these millennials? I'll do what I can. I'm not the best at advice, but I'll try. Well, you just wrote an entire <laughs> 200 page tome uh, advising men on how to get better. So let's see, let's see what we can do. Okay, we're going to call Jen in Highland Park. Well, you can just make fun of people too, which you're very good at. I wouldn't do that. You're I'll make allowed. Fun of you guys. No, you're allowed to. It's part of it's the theme. Hi, Jen. Hi, Jen. Hello. How are you? Hey, uh, it's I'm Natasha. Good. It's Natasha, Moshe, and our good friend Michael Ian Black. Hello. Hello. How's it going, Jen? It's going pretty good. How are you all? Oh, we're just great. We're just talking about uh, toxic masculinity. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you're here. here. Example. <laughs> um, so tell us what's going on, guys. Um. Okay. So a little bit of context. We uh, Pre-pandemic, we had a group of friends that we were really tight with. We've uh, been friends for a lot of years. My husband grew up with uh, a lot of them um, and we'd spend all of our time together. Um, Went through a lot of milestones, marriage, having kids, um, like regular weekly dinners, celebrate all of our events. Uh, We don't live near our families, so they were like the main crux of our support system. Let me guess, are Um, they all QAnon now? (laughs) Yes, yes. Deep in the queue, deep in the queue. (laughs) Okay, keep going. Um, so once the pandemic hit, we haven't seen some of them at all, um, which has been tough. Um, and there's this one couple that we were friends with. We were, you know, like I said, did everything together, but we also were really different from them. And a lot of times would roll our eyes or question some of the things that they did that were um, different than how we would handle things. Like, Can you give us one example? They would like talk shit on their little kid in front of him. Um, Things we always be like, really? Did you just do that? We talk about it when we get in the car at the end of going to see them. They'd invite us on like weekend trips. Like talk what kind of shit? Would they be like, did you see what he was wearing today? Like (laughs) what kind of shit were they talking Um, (laughs) about? Uh, one time he was he it, it, young kid right like uh, under five under four, and was having a rough time with something and was just kind of like being a kid and I think one of them was like nobody cares and then said the kid's <laughs> name. <laughs> he might have been drunk, but still. <laughs> and we were just kind of uh, like, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> That is, um, that is the worst bit of audio from your parent you could ever receive. <laughs> Nobody cares? I, aren't you the one person that's supposed to always care? Like, no, Aww. no one. Not one person. Yeah. Um, and then earlier in the summer, they invited us on a weekend trip, which pandemic, we weren't going to go anyways, um, but invited us to go just Thursday. Like, we wanted to take two days of the week off to just go on a trip for 
Thursday with our kids during the pandemic. So just things that were like nice, but also super inconvenient and not very thoughtful. Um, anyways, pandemic hits, we haven't seen them at all. We've barely even talked with them, but they've also just been handling the pandemic really poorly um, or just not taking it seriously, having parties, no masks, people over to their house. Um, you know, I asked, they had a, a gender reveal party, uh, which would have annoyed me anyways, but they um, like had the party and I was like, what was it like getting all those people tested? And they're like, well, the people in town did, but the people out of town, you know, you can only do so much. And I was just like, what do you mean you can only do so much? Like one person coming in could infect everyone. Um, so I guess our question is, is the way someone handles the pandemic, like, a reason to change your relationship with them going forward? Or how do you reconcile it and maybe uh, approach that friend or those friends about their behavior during a pandemic? It's definitely a character um, <clears throat> signifier. Like, you know, because people always say, you know, it's like through thick and thin and like we've, we're living through thin. So like, how are people acting? It's easy when everything's great. To be like a good friend and not, yeah. I, I think, I mean, I it's a deal breaker for me personally, but. Michael, what do you think? Um, so first of all, I think what you guys need to understand is the pandemic is a hoax. <laughs> <laughs> you were at the gender reveal party, right, Michael? Yeah, I'm out of town. <laughs> um, I Here's what I honestly think. I don't think you need to say anything to them about how they handled the pandemic because what is that going to accomplish? Um, I think it may force you to reevaluate your relationship with them because I agree with Natasha. It, do, it, is a, it does reveal something about character and intention and their priorities. Um, but the deal breaker for me is a gender reveal party. Like that's just- <laughs> like, what the fuck That's a bridge doing? too like, far. <laughs> that's, so, that's such a bridge too far for me. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think people are in our lives sometimes and then they're not in our lives sometimes and then they may come back into your life at some at some time. And none of that, it's not foretold that just because you're friends with somebody or you were close with somebody under some circumstances that you're going to be close with them under different circumstances. And that's OK. And it doesn't mean it doesn't mean either of you are bad people. Um it does sound like their son is a dick, so that might be a reason. <laughs> but nobody cares. <laughs> yeah, is he a dick because nobody cares, or does nobody care because he's a dick? Chicken or egg question. It's really a chicken or egg question. Because honestly, I started hearing the story, and I was like, I don't care. Yeah. You know? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I I think, here's my thoughts. Uh, if you had said, these are our best friends in the world, we love these people so much, and we just care about them so much, but there's this one area where they uh, we have diverged in this harsh way and it's really heartbreaking i would have felt more compassion and like you know empathy for the situation but you started off with all this pre-pandemic complaint about them it rem it rem it's not like a it, it seems so much of a simpler choice like do you ever see a bronx tale either of you ever watched a bronx tale great no. movie but there's this recurring a uh, um, gag in the film that this like neighborhood guy owes the main kid in the film 20 bucks and he's always running after the guy going like where's my 20 bucks and then the, the neighborhood guy runs away going like I'll get it to you I'll get it to you I'll get it to you and he's getting angrier and angrier throughout the movie until he finally like grabs him and he's about to beat the shit out of him and the local mob boss the, the, the mafia Don pulls the kid aside who's owed the $20 and says how much does he owe you and he says, 20 bucks. And he goes, isn't that amazing? It only costs you $20 to get this person. He goes, do you like him? He goes, no, he's the worst. He goes, great. It only costs you $20 to get this kid out of your life forever, right? And that's what I'm reminded of in this situation. Like the pandemic has come along like the savior to all of your social questions answered. You already didn't want to hang out with these people. And now the pandemic has given you this very simple way of just like taking a bit of distance and just going like, well... We can just back away from this relationship. And just like Michael said, you don't have to say anything. You can just like let them drift away. And honestly, holding super spreading events is worse than 
a lot of things people would do that would make me not be friends with them anymore. You know, like, it, it, have you ever gone out to eat with someone and they're like mean to the wait staff or, you know what I mean? Like those kind of things you're like, oh, these aren't my type of people. Like, I don't really want to hang out with people who act like that. So I think that it's, it's, it's kind of serious actually, you know, what they're doing. So I, I say that. I think the hard thing for me is that like she said, known the, one of the, the, the guy and the, a couple for a really long time. I'm his best man at his wedding. He was in my wedding. So like to say that they are like really good friends, I'd say it's true. I think we all probably have our relationships with our friends where we talk a little bit of shit on them here, talk a little bit, you know what I mean? Like it's just kind of venting about situations that happen. But I think that was so it's hard. It's it's a it's a hard one. It sounds like you like these people and your wife thinks they're trash. And I don't know if that's something you like need to resolve in your relationship. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it has to be cut and dry. I don't think you have to be like, we're never speaking to you again, but I think you're uncomfortable with the way they're behaving. Then give it some distance. Yeah. You I, know, I totally, and, and heal that wound. I totally agree. Like I, I didn't mean to uh, be dismissive of your relationship with them. I think my point was you were already expressing anxiety about this relationship. And par part of what happens is when you have old friends where all you have t uh, in common is the amount of time that you've known each other. I've had a lot of those, a lot of, friendships like that where the main thing we the main thing connecting us was our history but our presence were not matching in any way that that you were already expressing that anxiety and exactly what michael said you don't have to cut these people out of your life but you were already wanting some distance and now you've gotten some literal physical distance it seems simpler i'll quickly say i i had a friend who i realized after about eight years of like bizarre cocaine you know weird social hurt i just kept getting hurt like i kept going back to this person expecting him to be a better friend i realized the only thing i needed to shift about my relationship with this person was my perception i was like he's already not acting like a friend all i have to do is stop expecting him to act like a friend and i will have freedom from this relationship ever since then i felt totally free and good about it so i i, I think that michael's right there's no need to have a big uh guillotine slice of your relationship but you just take the space you need tosh i mean I said what I wanted to say. All right. All right, guys. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, that was great. It was great. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you. Bye, you guys. Good Natasha luck. Natasha and everybody. Sounds like he liked my <laughs> advice the best. Thank you. <laughs> That is a thing. Like, we are very divided. And I do think that, like, it's going to be really hard after the pandemic is over to, like, be friends with people who were not taking it seriously and just, like you know, harassing people or whatever. Well, the pandemic's hard too because it's not like you made a social choice that makes me uncomfortable. It's like you might kill me if I hang out with you. <laughs> yeah, which isn't great. That's not a great <laughs> characteristic in a friendship, I would say. No, is no. You kill me. It's kind of a classic, a classic no thank you. <laughs> uh, can we take another one, Mosh? You want to do another call? We could do some oh, secrets. Oh, wait, Michael, what would you prefer? Would you rather talk to someone else or you can listen to some people who've left some dark secrets on the hotline. Uh, it's totally your call. I mean, it's your show, but I guess dark secrets sounds more exciting. Let's do it. Let's play some secrets. Hi, Natasha. Hi, Moshe. My secret is that I am a student who moved back home due to COVID. And I was masturbating in the middle of the day. And I was watching porn. And when people are home, I always have to sound off because I don't want them to hear and a couple minutes in, my dad knocks on my door and asks me to disconnect from his Bluetooth speaker. <laughs> and I was mortified and awkwardly shouted back, like, was it playing something or whatever? And he just goes, yep, can you, like, permanently forget my speaker? So I'm laying in bed for, like, 30 minutes just crying. And, like, I was terrified to see him because the porn was just, like, normal porn. It was the porn of me and my boyfriend. <sighs> And I still have no idea if my dad could tell it was me moaning or having sex. So, yeah, that's all. Love Wait. The podcast. She watches porn of herself? I know the ego, <laughs> the unmitigated ego of watching your, yourself as porn. There's something really sweet about that. Like, you could watch any porn in the world and you're watching yourself in a committed relationship with somebody. <laughs> I think that's really tough. I also kind of like how the dad handled it. 
Yes. You know, he seemed pretty chill. Mm -hmm. Like my mom would have just been like, what is happening? And just like crying and screaming <laughs> and, you know, like overreacting. There was there was something nice about him uh, focusing on the technology aspect of it <laughs> rather than the content. He's just like, could you permanently forget my Bluetooth speaker? I'm really Bluetooth. I know is a tricky technology and I'm going to focus on that. <laughs> OK, that was you could also forget me. <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I doubt he thinks it's as big a deal as she thinks it is. Well, it's like, all right, it's embarrassing for you, but like, okay, it's, it's not, it's not a big deal. It does make a difference if he was able to identify the moaning. Well, it makes a difference in so much as if he recognizes her moaning, and that's something you need to think about. Uh, <laughs> that's a different issue. That's <laughs> a totally different <laughs> And I would say more problematic <laughs> relationship. But you know how dirty talk works is that sometimes you'll toggle between moaning and you're using your speaking voice. So it could be like, oh, oh. And he's like, oh, she's watching porn. And she's like, fuck yeah. And he's like, oh, my God, that's Adelia. What the hell? That's my daughter. <laughs> well, hopefully he'll forget about it. I mean, maybe he thinks the worst. The worst thing is maybe he thinks that she's like. Um, like doing a side hustle where she's doing porn. The worst thing, Michael, sounds like you're trapped in the handcuffs of masculinity. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Busted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's hear another one. Hi, um, I have a secret for the secret line. So when I was in college, I was really broke, like a lot of people, but I also had a some of an alcohol issue and I didn't like to pay for it very much. So what I would do is like one time I was drinking at a bar and sitting at the bar and I, my drink was almost done. So I put it at the edge of the bar and the bartender came and took it and started cleaning the glass. And I was like, Oh, my drink wasn't done. So she was like, Oh, sorry. And gave me a new drink. So I was like, Ooh, I'll do that again. So what I started doing was just drinking my drink almost to the end, putting it on like the edge of the bar towards the bartender and then when they would come away to throw it up throw it away i would be like oh, oh i wasn't done and then like most of the time they give me a free drink <laughs> oh, thanks well you got to rotate spots right like you got to rotate bars to keep doing this oh your little i wasn't done hustle yeah, <laughs> yeah. i mean i definitely <laughs> would have done something like that have you ever had any hustles michael when you were when you were a younger less successful man or now that you're a less successful man um, again, have you? do you have any hustles? One that I can, the only one comparable one that I can think of, and I mean, you guys, this is, this is pretty bad. When Ben Grant and I were in college, we went, do you, do you, do you, you guys know New York? Do you know New York? Yeah. Yeah. Big, we went big, to the, the city never sleeps, right? Big, big city. Yeah. It's a big, big city. Apple. There's big a, Apple. Yeah. That's cool. There's a restaurant there called the Mexicali Cab Company, which is a kind of famous Mexican restaurant. Not not good, but they have a big yellow sort of taxi on their roof. And um, I mean, I don't know if the statute of limitations is up for this or not, but Ben and I went there and then uh, they gave us the free chips and salsa. And then they and then the, and then we just ate the chips and salsa. And when the waitress came back and said, "Are you ready to eat?" We said, "Oh, we need another minute, but could we have some more chips and salsa?" <laughs> Guys, we probably went through three baskets of chips and salsa. And then would you leave? Yeah. Well, we might have ordered something small. A scandal. That now that is a scandal. That's if it gets out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My career's already in tatters. I don't know what's going to happen. Dude, I don't know if you've heard of a little something called cancel culture, <laughs> but <laughs> you're running the risk of having that fall on you like a ton of bricks. What about you, Tosh? you have any hustles? Oh, I was always trying to get stuff for free. I mean, when you're broke, it's one thing if you're doing it for the thrill. That's a little more psychotic. But if you're broke and you figured out how to like get some free food, I mean... I used to eat off people's plates when I was waitressing when the food would come back. So, I mean, that's not really a hustle. That's just more of like my Dickensian roots. <laughs> Dickensian. I'm like from a Christmas carol. <laughs> I used to, we used to do a thing, my friends and I, when we were really young teenagers, where we would eat at this, uh, at a restaurant. And then one of us would, this was right when smoking indoors was becoming illegal. 
So we'd light up, one of us would light up a cigarette and the per, the restaurateur would run over and go, hey, you can't smoke in here. And be like, oh my God, sorry. And go outside and be like, like we're going to finish and then just leave. I guess I was just robbing from a small a You small mean business. after you ate there? I mean, we were teenagers. Ugh. But if it, I had a restaurant, I would not let a group of teenagers eat there. I don't know if that's legal. <laughs> I'm not sure you can do that. <laughs> All right, should we play Oh, oh wait, wait. I used to shoplift. Oh, yeah, me too. I was always shoplifting. Oh, yeah. no, I shoplifted. Please don't get me wrong. I shoplifted a lot. Oh, okay. You did. All right. I mean, that's just yeah, like part of being young, right? Well, it reminds me of um, of that Todd Berry joke. You know that Todd Berry joke? He goes, a friend of mine said, I, I have a hot tip for getting free movies at, the, at, at your hotel room. He's like, oh, what is it? He's like, oh, you order the movie, you watch it, and then you call down and say there was something wrong with the broadcast and you couldn't see it, and they'll take it off your bill. And Todd's like, oh, so your hot tip is stealing. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a hot <laughs> tip on getting free blueberries at the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well, let's listen to one more. One more. Let's do it. I like your delivery better than Todd. Oh, hey, thanks. guys. <laughs> um, so one time I was... Um, like eight or nine, um, I had this big stuffed animal panda, okay, and I I I literally just pissed on it. Like I I I decided I wanted to know, I guess what it would feel like to piss on my panda. I I, I genuinely don't know, but um, I then blamed it on my dog. I don't know if my mom never found out um, or just knew from the human amount of piss that was on the panda, <laughs> but um, I watched her clean it up. Um, yeah. Love you guys. Bye. Okay. Can I just say if a woman did this, we'd be like, she needs to go to a therapist. I don't know. You think so? But like a man is just like, oh, what would hey, happen if I did this on my I'm panda? pissing on a panda for me. <laughs> Anytime a moment of vulnerability is happening in like a thick New York accent, I'm <laughs> delighted. <laughs> I want to know if that guy, how deep into furry culture that guy is right now. <laughs> Just based on the accent, I'm going to guess that much like the concepts you're talking about in the book, there are things that he wants to be into, but he's held back by his ideas of what it must mean to be a man. So he can't, he can't go back to pissing on the panda like he wants to as an adult. I'd sort of, I I feel like I have the imp impulse to just pee on things sometimes. Sure. There was a whole pool in my backyard. I was like, I'm going to try to fill this hole with my pee. And how, and how did, I did. It, it, and it filled up? I mean, most, I, I didn't, I didn't feel it all though. I did. I mean, I did a respectable job. Now that's going to be my book called a, a letter to my boy girl. And I'm just going to talk to her about the different places I've tried to fill up with pee pee. Well, our boy girl daughter, she definitely pees outside and stands up and pees. And, you know, she just like barely squats, you know, like she's very <laughs> into that. So I kind of like it. Yeah. Well, we taught her how to pee in the woods like it was an exciting thing because we, we, were, we were trying to teach her how to pee outside because it's difficult to always pull. Uh, in the pandemic, you can't go to like uh, bathrooms on the side of the road. You kind of have to go into a bush. Oh, but you, you have a toilet in your house. We no, don't have a toilet. We don't. We don't. <laughs> we just have one child's toilet in the yard. That's why Natasha was saying you're living the dream. She didn't mean living in the beautiful woods of <laughs> Connecticut. She meant plum indoor plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but our our uh our practices are definitely gonna backfire when our child enters school. And starts pissing in the <laughs> playground. Starts just peeing in the playground. <laughs> you know, one of the nice things about this is that the secrets are pretty tame. You know, like what are like you know these are these are these are very uh, small things. I think you know, and well, it, and it just goes to show you, like we all, we all do embarrass. It's no big. So what? Totally agree. So you peed on a panda. We, exactly. Uh, that's kind of the point of it is that everybody's got a thing that they're ashamed of, but nine out of ten times, it's not shame worthy. Although last week we had somebody who called in saying that uh, she she used a, an expired COVID test a, to get in to see her friend's newborn baby. <laughs> so sometimes, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> do we have a dark one to say goodbye to Michael do, for a final, our final hurrah? Do we have a, a wild one? I want, I want to impress Michael. 
We got something? This is better. We're Sometimes getting a, they're we're disgusting. Getting a, we're getting a so-so hand from our producer, so maybe. Let's see what happens. This will be the this will be the last one that we can let you go, Michael. Back to staring at the woods. Hello, Natasha. Hello, Moshe. So on my uncle's bachelor party, he bought me a prostitute. Um, I had sex with a hmm. prostitute, and I did not come. And then a couple of hours later, I ended up having sex with a woman three times my age, and I came after, I'm going to be generous to say, 30 seconds. <laughs> so that was my secret. Never told anyone before. Um, love the podcast. Thank you very much. Party seconds? <laughs> what did he say? 30. 30 seconds. Oh, 30 seconds. But it did definitely sound like party seconds. I would say that similarly to hearing a, a a man in a bronx accent get vulnerable <laughs> hearing a puerile like sexcapade from a um, an irish man there's something very beautiful and romantic about it so he tried to pump it with the prostitute didn't come and then he was with a cougar and came in 30 seconds he was yeah all right that's a wild night did that do it I, for you michael I mean, were you satisfied yeah i mean I don't know if you can see my hands, but they're <laughs> they're tubing they're, they're tubing right now, are they? <laughs> yeah. Ew. Um, I'm tubing. What? Yeah, we're all tubing at some point. That's disgusting. So male. What can I say? Um, well, I mean, I just think I think prostitute. I I don't think I could never be with a prostitute why not what, what? I just like i just couldn't get into it i have a moral objection to it i to it because i just wouldn't i couldn't believe the fantasy of it you wouldn't believe you wouldn't be able to convince yourself that they wanted to be with you you mean yeah it's just I, transactional and, and, and if i didn't, yeah it would be it would just it would it would just be too too sad and awkward and uncomfortable for me i think i mean that's what's hot about it is that it's transactional that's the, I think that's what people like about it is not that you're convinced. I mean, everybody's different and people have different views, I guess. Some people are like, oh, no, she really likes me. But I think part of what men like about it or people like about it is it's like, oh, I don't have to worry at all about any of the emotionality of this interaction. I literally just drop the check at the door and have have fun and leave. Yeah, I would not want to fuck someone who I was paying. Like that would just be so alienating to me well i don't think i could do that michael, michael you sound like a like a great father and a generous lover well wait wait <laughs> i i have a counterpoint you, do, don't you love um doing comedy and like being on stage and and performing and having a good time uh sure so that's a transaction and you're enjoying the hell out of it. So ostensibly, there are plenty. I don't of have an objection to transactions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> It sounds like, I, like you do, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm on stage doing comedy and they're not also enjoying it, I'm not going to be enjoying myself. No, my point. Oh, wait, no. What if Michael performed but paid everyone to come see no, him? No, no, no. <laughs> my point here is that, that there are sex workers out there who are enjoying the, the, the transactional process. They're enjoying the, the work. They're enjoying their work. They're having a good time doing the work. It doesn't mean they lust for you. It means that they are enjoying their work or something like that. What do you think? I think I would just have a hard time. I, it, I, it's, it's too intimate a thing for me to like not feel like it's go going both ways. I Jesus just couldn't. Christ. I don't think I could do it. Michael, be a man and get a prostitute. Just do it. <laughs> no, Michael, Moshe's always on about this because he wants to get a three-way with a prostitute. So he's always trying to like talk it up, normalize it, just like make it it's seem normal. like something everybody wants to do. I know it's normal, but it's not normal for us. Well, anyway, sounds like you two have a lot in common. I'm going to let you sign off so you can do a <laughs> private Zoom, the two of you. <laughs> Um, Michael, if Natasha, I would do that with you. If you <laughs> Natasha, if you wanted to be a prostitute, I would do that. <laughs> Wait, you guys are going to have a three-way with a prostitute, but I don't get to go? <laughs> oh, let's yeah. get Moshe like a glass window or something. <laughs> oh, this is so sad. I knew it was going to come to this. I Wait, there's a glass window behind you, Michael. I'm going to... 
we're gonna fly out to Connecticut. You can eyes wide shut a prostitute into your place, and I'll stand right out there in the cold woods in the December of Connecticut. COVID tested though. COVID tested only. Oh wait, you can't COVID test if the prostitutes from out of town. It's impossible. There's oh, so only so much it. you can do. All right. Well, maybe late next September. <laughs> All right. That sounds like a plan. Um, Michael, it's been so great talking to you. I really miss you. Um, let us know when you're back in Los Angeles. Um, everyone right. get Michael's book. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. Yeah, get Michael's a book. A Better Man. I kind of sped through the whole thing. It was it was such a great read. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and it's uh, available available in book, sh- book shoppies. Love it. it. It's a good gift, actually, for right now. It's all about to be Christmas, and so get your son or husband or even anybody. Get it for your husband, I think. I yeah. think it's like it's it's it really did kind of open my eyes a little bit to the problems that you guys have, <laughs> and what to, and like what to do about it, and how to think about it, and how we can all kind of try to go towards this new place, which is essential. Uh, Michael Ian Black, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for joining us. Appreciate it, and uh, see you soon. We miss you. Bye, Michael. Uh, Guys, well, Natasha, I have to say that I was jealous of the plan, but because it was my plan in the first place, the whole threesome with the prostitute thing, Mm -hmm. but because you seemed enthusiastic about it, (laughs) um, I'm going to let it happen and I'll tell you with Michael. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. You guys seem like you're into it, I'll tell you why. Why? Because I want you to be happy, and I'll tell you why. Because you want to normalize it, and you're like, okay, now we can do it with me. No, <laughs> it's because... Are you ready for this, Natasha? Okay. It's because I love you. I love you, too. Okay.